This is a 4.5 part one. We're going to get into uh, the beginnings of graphing sine and cosine functions. The essential question is uh, for this section, what are the characteristics of the graphs of sine and cosine functions? Really important for us to understand the basics uh, of the different characteristics. When you forget the characteristics or when you don't understand them, that's what makes graphing these functions quite a bit hard. So uh, today uh, off of this, you're going to learn we're going to explore the characteristics of sine and cosine functions. We just said that. And we're also going to talk about how to stretch and shrink the sine and cosine functions. So hopefully that is going to be a little bit familiar with things that we've done in the past with uh, graphing certain types of functions. We first want to talk about domain and range. Now, domain and range is something you've probably dealt with a little bit uh, in Algebra 2 or even Algebra 1. But we want to make sure that we define what domain is. So domain, just for any function, simply means the possible input values. And I'm going to put in parentheses x because x is typically our input value. And then our range is our possible output values. And again, I'm going to put y in parentheses for this. And we're going to say based on the input. So the idea is that we're going to get a defined domain based on what can be plugged in or what can be input into our function. So if there is no restriction to our input values, then our domain is just all real numbers. So when dealing with sine and cosine, our domain is all real numbers. And the reason is, is because there is no restriction to what we can plug in for our sine or cosine. There's, there's nothing that makes it undefined, essentially. So that's the domain. Now, we'll, So tangent is going to be, if you recall, tangent of theta is equal to the sine of theta over the cosine of theta. So in reality, what we need to do is we need to figure out where is the bottom equal to zero. So the domain doesn't work anywhere here because whatever your input value is, if you get zero on the bottom, you're going to have a problem. So here we can say that the tangent is all real numbers, but we are going to have some restrictions. And we're going to say where theta, in this case, it could be x, it's any of your input, inputs, where theta is not equal to, and we will say this. If you think about a the unit circle, and we think about tangent being y over x, the tangent right here, which is the coordinate here is 0, 1, y over x would be 1 over 0. And if you think about this, this is pi halves. And then down here, it's 0, comma, negative 1, which would be negative 1 over 0, and this is 3 pi over 2. So it's undefined at pi halves and 3 pi over 2, but this will keep going around in a circle over and over and over and over again. So we would say that it's pi halves plus pi n. And in this case, n represents any integer, like as in pi halves plus pi times 1, because if we have pi halves plus pi, we're going to be at 3 pi over 2. If we have pi halves plus 2 pi, we're going to be right back at where we were at with the pi over uh, the pi halves initially. If n is 0, then we're going to be at pi halves. If n is negative 1, then we're going to be at negative pi halves. The point is, is no matter what you plug in for n here, we will always be at one of these two, two positions, which will always make our cosine 0. Okay, so if that doesn't make a, a lot of sense now, we'll get into that a little bit later. But this is what our in general domain would be. We just need to understand what domain is and what range is. So for the sine and cosine for, tan, uh, for the range, now we haven't seen graphs of this yet, but you can kind of notice that the highest that a graph goes is 1, and the lowest it goes is negative 1. So the range for this would be negative 1 is less than or equal to y which is less than or equal to 1. In other words, sine and cosine for the general functions will just go in between negative 1 and 1. And then for tangent, this is all real numbers. Even with the restrictions that we have in our domain, we still get all real numbers for our tangent. And again, this is just a characteristic of our graph, so that way we can, we can understand why it looks like it does.
Okay, so let's get into more characteristics. Amplitude. Amplitude, so the first thing, amplitude, we're going to define this as the distance. And we're going to use regular terms from the middle of the curve to the top or bottom. So the amplitude of a normal sine and cosine curve is just one, because from the middle to the top is one, from the middle to the bottom is just one. Periodic. Periodic means that every sine and cosine function is periodic, meaning that it goes on forever in a continuous cycle. Okay, in other words, it repeats itself. Okay, and then the period can be defined as, and this is a little bit different, periodic means that it goes over and over and over again. For a period, we're going to call this the amount it takes for the graph to make a full cycle. So the amount it takes for a graph to make a full cycle. Okay, And we call it a complete full cycle. And really a full cycle, when you guys look at that unit circle we deal with, that is like a full circle around. Okay, But this is going to talk about how long does it take for it to make one full cycle to get back to where it started. Okay, And, we're, and you'll see that when we start graphing. Okay, so when we stretch and shrink uh, sine and cosine, you should be familiar with this A and B a little bit. Okay, the, the uh, number that goes in front of the X, the A is going to change some things. So what we're going to say here is B is going to be what determines a, a stretch or a shrink. So we're going to say if B is greater than 1 or if B is less than negative 1, our graph is going to shrink. In other words, if we have a whole number in front of there, whether it's positive or negative, our graph is going to get skinnier. It's going to shrink. And then if negative 1 is less than b, which is less than positive 1, in other words, if it's in between negative 1 and 1, if we get a fraction that is less than 1 or greater than uh, negative 1, then we're going to get a stretch. And this is kind of a a graph that you should be familiar with. With all the other functions, it kind of does the same thing. You just have to understand that it's going to be what's in front of the x that, that changes it a little bit. Okay, now b. What does b refer to? So b is referring to the frequency of your graph. So anytime you see b, that's the frequency. And frequency relates Eh, that's not a good word. Frequency refers to how many times a graph cycles through over a 2 pi distance. In other words, if we had a graph and we went from 0 to 2 pi, and again, you'll see this as we start graphing, if this is 2 pi and this is 0, the frequency would tell us how many times our sine and cosine curve would make a cycle in between 0 and 2 pi. And you will see how this works in a little bit here. So before we actually learn to graph, let's talk a couple things, that, a couple of things, characteristics that we've defined here. We have amplitude. Amplitude refers to A in our equation. Okay, so if you see the number in front of sine or cosine, that is the amplitude. The other way you can figure out your amplitude if you don't have an equation is you take your max value, subtract your minimum value, and divide by 2. So the max, the top value minus the bottom value divided by 2 will also give you your amplitude. For your period, 
Your period is not a specific part in your equation. Your period get is comes from your B. So how do we use that? Well, period will be equal to 2 pi over the frequency. So 2 pi is our typical full circle. If we divide that by the frequency, that will give us how long it takes for our graph to go through one full cycle. And then we will add this last one down here, frequency. How do we find frequency? And remember, frequency is our B in our equation. B equals 2 pi divided by P. So you can see these two formulas are pretty much the same. Period is 2 pi divided by frequency. Frequency is 2 pi divided by period. So it's important for us to know that. Okay, let's get into something really easy here. What I'd like you guys to do is, based on the formulas that I just gave you, I'd like to see if you guys can come up with these on your own. Come up with the amplitude and the period of, the, of all three of these functions. Uh, submit your answer and let's see how you do. Okay, so here's uh, our solutions here. Amplitude is 1 fourth, period is 2 pi. Amplitude is 2, period is 2, because 2 pi divided by pi, the pi's cancel out. Down here, amplitude is 1 third, period. This is one area that you guys may struggle with a little bit, is when you have 2 pi divided by a fraction, please understand that a fraction is smaller than 1. So like if I were to say, hey, I want you to divide up two pizzas between you know, everyone's going to have a half a pizza. You should understand, you should understand how many people that can feed. So two divided by one half is four and then the pi remains. Okay. So let's move on. Let's start getting into the graphing. This is basically what our section is about is the beginnings of graphing here. So let's talk about a sine graph first. So we're going to just do generic sine graphs just to start because you need to understand how this works. So if we just take y equals sine of x y equals sine of x is going to have an amplitude of 1, and it's going to have a period of 2 pi divided by 1, which is just 2 pi. One of the things that I want you guys to understand, and which is really important, is always think about what is going on on the unit circle or on the circle that we normally draw. So if we go all the way around and we draw this unit circle, here's what I want you to think about. This point right here is 1 comma 0. This point up here is 0, 1. This point over here is negative 1, 0. And this point down here is 0, negative 1. That will always be true no matter what with all of these points. What I want you to think about is not only where are the radians, so pi halves, pi, 3 pi over 2, and 2 pi, and 0, you need to understand what are your sine values at all of those. And this is something that we've already covered, knowing that the sine is the y value, and these are all of our major points. And what I want you to think about here is when we start our sine graph, which is at zero, as you can see from that coordinate, what I want you to do is I want you to think about breaking your graph up into quadrants. Why would I say quadrants? Well, because these are all quadrants. I want you to think about breaking your graph up from major point to major point to major point, to major point, to major point. So that means that our first major point that I want to label is going to be pi over 2. And the second major point that I want to label is going to be pi. And the third major point that I'm going to label is 3 pi over 2. And the fourth major point that I'm going to label is going to be 2 pi. This is how we graph all generic cosine and sine functions. And if you notice, when we get up to pi over 2, our sine value is equal to 1. And then when we get over to pi, our sine value is back to 0. And then when we get to down to 3 pi over 2, our sine value is equal to negative 1. And then when we get back up to 2 pi, it's back to 0. And you can see, or you should be able to see, this cyclical graph. And what you should notice from here is remember when we said that the period is 2 pi and period represents the time it takes to make one full cycle. So you should notice from this how it goes all the way up, all the way down, and then back up again to exactly where it started. And then it starts the cycle over again. So really important for you to know these three or these four points and how to break it up into quadrants. All right, we're going to continue this into another video. So make sure you click on part two of this video.